Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Elwood, and I want to welcome all of you here to the Howard Kennedy School and the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. It's my very distinct honor uh, to welcome our speaker for today, Ambassador Dennis Ross, who will speak on something that is uh, both compelling in its title and very much in keeping with this remarkable conference that's been going on. Paradigm Shift, How to Innovate the Peace Process. Now, let me first acknowledge the Institute of Politics for all the work they've done, but most especially all the organizers of the Harvard-Israel Conference. <laughs> all of us that have put together things like this have some idea of what's involved, and I can't imagine how you pulled it off. So very well done. Uh, so let me now um, uh, say just a couple of words. The conference itself, as most of you are participating in, I think, uh, small country, big ideas, uh, was in fact organized entirely by students from around the university. And uh, it really is a testament both to the uh, goal of the conference, but also the uh, spirit, the, the strong on Israel's vibrant and in innovative spirit, uh, indeed, even at times of great turmoil. And uh, the hundreds of guests I was, a was able to participate last night as well, and the extraordinary speakers is, has really been uh, exceptional, and I'm sure what happened today was even more remarkable. So now let me turn to talk about uh, our speaker today. Uh, and um, just because Ambassador Ross is one of those people that frankly, I think most of the students at the Kennedy School and maybe at the university can and do aspire to be. Uh, someone who is a remarkable public servant, a thought leader in every sense of the word, and a person of remarkable individual and personal integrity. Um, his life has uh, been a, a set of goals and work that's designed to bring answers to some of the hardest questions that we could ever face. And those are nuanced and complex answers to nuanced and complex questions. Um, He's one of those few people that's uh, worked on some of the most vital diplomatic issues and, and uh, international relations issues as much under Republicans as Democrats. Um, in a time when virtually every issue in this country seems to take on a partisan cast, maybe more each year, um, Dennis Ross is one of those rare individuals who's been trusted by both sides. Uh, he's had vital positions under Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, and Barack Obama, more even than David Gergen. Um, <laughs> he, he has been, uh, he's uh, uh, done a very great deal in his career. Back when he got his PhD from UCLA, um, he was focused on Soviet decision making and he's had plenty of time to work on those issues, ranging from the policy towards the former Soviet Union to unification of Germany, integration into NATO, and uh, arms control. During the Reagan years, he was the director of Near East and South Asia studies and worked at the Pentagon as well. And, but Dennis Ross is really most closely, closely identified with his work in the Middle East. And for more than 12 years, Ambassador Ross has played really the leading role in shaping uh, U.S. involvement in Middle East peace negotiations and dealing directly with the parties and the negotiations. Um, and he was very instrumental in assisting both Israelis and Palestinians to reach the 1995 Interim Agreement. He also successfully brokered the 1997 Hebron Accord, facilitated the 1994 Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty, and intensively worked to bring Israel and Syria together. He served briefly as the Special Advisor to the Persian Gulf and Southeast Asia to Secretary Clinton, and um, then later joined the National Security Council as Special Assistant to President, Senior Director of the Central Region. Now the Central Region, uh, is a really kind of boring one, kind of sounds like, you know, Minnesota where I'm from and stuff like that. But in, um, in national security, it's just uh, the Persian Gulf, the Middle East, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and South Asia. <coughs> Last November, Ambassador Ross left the Obama administration and returned as counselor at the Washington Institute, where he was previously the Institute Ziegler's Distinguished Fellow and Counselor from 2001 to 2009. In, with his in his free time, he writes uh, remarkable books and articles, including most recently, Myths, Illusions, and Peace, Finding a New Direction for America in the Middle East, co-authored with David Mikowski. And for example, another prominent book of his is Statecraft and How to Restore America's Standing in the World. No surprise, therefore, that he has gotten very high public service and academic awards. 
He's uh, been awarded the Presidential Medal for Distinguished Federal Civilian Service by President Clinton. Um, and Secretaries Baker and Albright both presented him with the State Department's highest award. Um, in addition, he's received UCLA's highest uh, uh, medal, honorary degrees from Amherst, Jewish Theological Seminary, Syracuse University. It's been quite a journey for a young man born in San Francisco uh, to a, a Jewish mother and a, and a Catholic father. We're very, very fortunate to have with us today Ambassador Dennis Day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've also taught at the Kennedy School uh, over a number of different years. And, you know, it is true the things that the Kennedy School tries to do is to blend the practical with the conceptual. Uh, and it's actually one of the most important things you can do. I also think that what this conference has been about is to blend the practical with the conceptual. Now, I have to, I have to make an admission. I didn't really know what the title of the talk was until my assistant last night gave me the title of the talk with a reference to the new paradigm and how to innovate on Middle East peace. And as I was flying up thinking about the issue of the new paradigm, uh, it occurred to me that there actually have been a number of paradigms over time when it comes to peacemaking. If you go back to the Gerald Ford administration and with Henry Kissinger being the embodiment, the instrument of diplomacy, he pursued what was known as an incremental approach to peacemaking. When Jimmy Carter came in, Jimmy Carter pursued what was known as a kind of comprehensive approach to peacemaking, the difference being that one was a step-by-step -step approach designed to build peace gradually. The other was you'll resolve all the issues at one time. And those represent different points of departure. Now, over the years, a lot of people have characterized my approach. Usually, I wasn't one of them, which is just worth noting. But the fact is, I was, even though I was always characterized, many people have characterized me as being an incrementalist, I was neither. For me, what mattered, what was the context? I did write a book called Statecraft, and in that book, I emphasized that the key to pursuit of statecraft is to be able to marry your objective and your means. And there are times when your objective is something that you can't achieve. It's still your objective, but you have to marry your objective to your means, and if the circumstances don't permit you to achieve your objective, then your challenge is to figure out a way to change the circumstances until, in fact, you're in a position where you can achieve that objective. So what I want to do today, in the end, I'm going to offer you a, a new hybrid model. Uh, it'll be I'll draw on certain elements from the winner of your, your prize, Joel. I will I'll at least lay out how your idea fits into my concept, uh, which turns out it's your concept as well. But to do that, I actually want to create, again, context, meaning I want to give you a sense of how the approach, how the models of peace have been pursued over time. If you go back to Oslo, because Oslo was basically, it's the real turning point when it comes to the effort to make peace at least between Israelis and Palestinians. Because prior to Oslo, this is an existential conflict. You, know, you have two national movements competing for the same space. That's what the Palestinian national movement is about, what the Jewish national movement has been about, which produced Israel, is the same thing. So there are two national movements competing for the same space. After 1967, basically, the Arab states were in a state-to-state -state conflict with Israel. It wasn't existential, at least in terms of what they were, or what they were focused on. But with the Palestinians, it was existential, and there, are, there will be those who say it is still existential. What Oslo did is take what was an existential conflict and at least seemingly transform it. Now, the logic of Oslo was an incremental logic. It was a step-by-step -step approach. Yitzhak Rabin's view was, we can't solve the big issues now. Jerusalem and refugees. Those are the narrative issues. Those are the issues that each side tells their stories about. Those are the issues that go to self-definition and identity. And Rabin's view is, we can't solve those now. We have to build a relationship of cooperation and coexistence with each other. And the more we learn to live with each other, the more we'll each gain a stake in terms of how we'll resolve the more fundamental issues. 
That was the logic of Oslo. It was incremental. It was step by step. And it was accepted by the Palestinians. Built in that model, by the way, was also what I'll call a ground up element. There was in the interim agreement a people to people annex. The purpose of which was to build a web of relations, not between leaders, but between societies. Now, obviously, Oslo didn't succeed. And there are two different narratives for why it failed. The Israeli narrative is that the Palestinians didn't fight terror the way they should have, uh, and they remained wedded to incitement, which meant they didn't really accept Israel. The Palestinian view was the Israelis didn't turn over power the way they were supposed to, so we didn't have the kind of stake we needed to take hard steps internally. And through the settlements, they also continued to engage in the kind of unilateral acts that highlighted our powerlessness. So each have a story and explanation for why Oslo didn't succeed. By the end of the Clinton administration, what had been an, a, an incremental approach was transformed into what was an effort to solve the conflict. That's what Camp David was about. That's what ultimately the Clinton parameters were about. But it's important to remember that the Clinton parameters were not a set of American principles for resolving the conflict. It was an American proposal that was offered because both sides at the end of the administration asked the United States to make a bridging proposal. It was a comprehensive bridging proposal on all the core issues, borders and security and refugees and Jerusalem. But it was still an American response to a request from the two sides to bridge the difference. It didn't succeed. I mean, if you want to get into the Q&A, and there's obviously a lot of historical revisionism about why it failed, I'm not what I would call a neutral observer on this one, having been the prime author of the Clinton parameters. So I'm not neutral, but I'm also someone who was there. But if we, we don't need to get into that now. I'm happy to get into it if you want to get into it. Needless to say that when the Bush administration came in, their, their view was very different. The President said, President Bush said, President Clinton wanted it too much. And the, the logic, his lesson from that was to take a step back. In fact, for the first few months of the Bush administration, the words peace process were basically banned from the vocabulary. And the, the basic approach at that time was a kind of disengagement. And to the extent there was a policy, it only emerged when the Mitchell Report was actually published in the spring. After 9-11 takes place, the preoccupation, the focus is on terror. It's not on peace between Israelis and Palestinians. And to the extent to which you see an effort made on diplomacy, it doesn't come until almost coincident with the beginning of the war in Iraq. When, because Tony Blair is an important uh, partner in this effort, and he feels there's a need at the same time to do something on the peace issue to show that there's not an indifference to it, that leads to the production of the roadmap, the roadmap to peace. Now, the roadmap to peace, again, fits a model. It was an incremental model. Why? Three phases. The first phase was you have to get each side taking steps to change the environment. So the Israelis were supposed to be taking steps that limited settlement activities. The Palestinians were supposed to be taking steps to restore law and order and fight terror. The second phase was the creation of a state with provisional borders phase two, and phase three was then only after you go through each of these phases and each phase, you can't go from one phase to the next until you complete each phase, only then do you begin to negotiate on permanent status. Now the roadmap to peace is something that is launched but isn't really translated. It's not really implemented. And with the, the worsening of the second intifada, uh, you end up seeing Prime Minister Sharon come up with a different model. It's a unilateral model. It's a unilateral withdrawal model. It's a dis disengagement model. At the time, I was outside the government, uh, and I was asked to write a piece actually by the Jerusalem Post after the Prime Minister made his initial speech. He made two speeches on disengagement. The first one was more generalizable, and then the second one he applied it. In between the two, I was asked to write a piece, and I actually wrote an article entitled Coordinated Unilateralism yet another model. And my argument was, look, it makes sense to take an initiative, but it doesn't make sense for only one side to have responsibility. And if Israel is the only one withdrawing and the Palestinians don't have any responsibility, that's going to be bad from several standpoints. 
First, it cements the idea that only one side is responsible. Secondly, if it's, if it's unilateral and only unilateral, it's the equivalent of throwing the keys over the fence and hoping for the best. And that will actually validate the Hamas narrative, which is that violence works. And you don't want to be validating the narrative of those who believe in violence. You want to be validating the narrative of those who believe in coexistence. So unless you're doing something in a coordinated way with those Palestinians who believe in coexistence and building them up, uh, building them up in the process, you're actually going to lend credence to the very forces that you really don't want to be lending credence to. I actually had a conversation with Prime Minister Sharon about this. He didn't like the, the concept of coordinated unilateralism because he said to me, and it's, it's a serious argument that one has to take into account. In the end, he was driven. I know here again, there's a lot of interesting revisionism, uh, but he was driven by the demographics argument. He may have come to it late, but his argument was, much like Rabin, and people tend to forget that the separation barrier, the author of the separation barrier was Yitzhak Rabin. And the reason for it was he was either going to negotiate partition, and if he couldn't negotiate partition, meaning into two states, there was going to be a separation. That's what the logic of the barrier was. Sharon came around to that logic because both of them believed that you had to ensure the Zionist dream of preserving Israel as a Jewish democratic state. And if you stayed in the territories, ultimately you could not. So he actually created the party Kadima because he knew he wasn't going to get Likud support after the withdrawal from Gaza, and he was going to not have 100% withdrawal from the West Bank, but he was planning a disengagement from the West Bank as well, probably through the barrier. But he said to me, when I raised this issue of the coordinated unilateralism, he said, I cannot allow the future of Israel to be determined by the Palestinians. If they're irresponsible, I can't let their irresponsibility determine my future. And even when I said, but it's in your interest to promote responsibility on their side, because that's the only way to ensure peace. That's the only way to ensure that both sides feel they have to do something. But his argument is one that one can't simply dismiss. And that, and that was, by the way, another model. So you have the incremental model, you have the concept model, you have the unilateral model, you had my putative effort to create a coordinated unilateralism model, uh, and you have the Bush administration by the end going back to the comprehensive model. That's what, Anal that's what Annapolis was. In the last two years of the Bush administration, the focus was on creating a deal, doing the whole thing. Now, here again, an effort was made. Omert made a proposal. Omert's proposal was never actually responded to. Now the, you know, here again you get competing narratives as to what happened here. One side says Omert offered a great deal, which by the way he did. He offered, uh, you know, he offered withdrawal that was nearly 100%. There was a slight gap between the amount of territory that he wanted to annex from the West Bank and the amount of territory that would be compensated for through swap, the difference was about 0.7% and the way he was going to, how he was going to reconcile that was how they were going to do the, the safe passage, how they were going to calculate safe passage. And he had, he proposed, you know, he had the proposal on Jerusalem and on refugees and on security. And the, the, the narrative on the Palestinian side was, well, he only offers this very late in the day uh, he offers it only after he's actually resigned. He's still prime minister, but he's resigned. So he's in no position to implement whatever it is he offers, and if Abu Mazen responds, then he's exposing himself. The counter-argument was, on the other side, is something profound was offered, and there was never a response to it. When the Obama administration comes in, the Obama administration comes in in the immediate aftermath of Cass Lev, and in a time period also where there are going to be elections within Israel, you're going to have a new government in Israel. And the initial efforts that are made in the Obama administration are related to trying to affect the context even before you push for negotiations. And that's where the issue of settlement freeze on the one side and Arab steps towards Israel on the other were developed. Now obviously that didn't materialize the way it was, it was sought. And the focus then became a focus very heavily geared toward trying to get to the negotiation. Uh, over a period of time, that proved to be very difficult. Eventually, negotiations, direct negotiations were begun uh, in September of 2010. 
They broke down after three weeks because the moratorium, which had been adopted by the Israelis for 10 months, came to an end. The efforts to extend it uh, were not fruitful. And from that point on, then there was a discussion, all right, what can be done to try to get to the negotiations and maybe frame the negotiations? And that eventually led to the president giving a speech, two speeches, uh, in May of 2011, which was a variation on the theme of, again, trying to resolve the conflict. But the variation on the theme was the president presented what were principles designed to create a foundation. What were the principles? The principles were on territory, 67 and nuclear group swap, uh, and security. The logic being that if you go ahead and you provide for each side a level of confidence on the fundamental things they need, meaning for the Palestinians, they get a sense of what the, the broad territorial outlines of their state will be. The Israelis, and they get a reassurance because of that, the Israelis get a sense that the core things they need as it relates to security are going to be satisfied. Each side's basic needs lay a foundation which then allows each of them to take on in a discussion the more narrative issues that I talked about before, meaning Jerusalem and refugees. Now, each side was able to restrain their enthusiasm for the partial principles. Uh, on the one hand, the Palestinians, Abu Mazen said he accepted them, but he didn't drop his conditions for negotiation, which continued to be, there had to be a settlement treaty. Uh, and on the other side, the prime minister you know, pointed out that he didn't, want, he didn't want this to be the point of departure for negotiations because it was, in a sense, already defining some of what needed to be done, although over the, over the summer, of 2011, there was movement, uh, at least on the Israeli side, and we sought to produce a broad quartet statement that would build on the basis of the two speeches that the president had made. In the end, we weren't able to finalize that broad statement. The, the Obama administration wasn't able to finalize that, but there was a court statement, a more limited quartet statement that was adopted on September 23rd of last year, which basically called for a resumption of talks without any preconditions, beginning with preparatory talks, and once those preparatory talks, which were supposed to be direct, not indirect, uh, were pursued over a course of 90 days, the two sides would then make comprehensive proposals on territory, meaning on borders and security. Now, because the, the preparatory talks, when they began, were indirect, not direct, and the preparatory talks themselves, when they became direct, were conducted in January of this year, we never quite got to that 90-day clock. But the model that was being applied was a model, again, focused on trying to resolve the conflict by starting with core principles that would lay a basis for being able to deal in time with the narrative issues. All right, so that kind of brings you up to date. So I've given you the context. Now you probably want to know, so what do I propose at this point? Well, we could go to questions right now. Or I could sort of lay out what is, what is the hybrid model. All right, so let me lay out what is a kind of hybrid model. But here again, I want to take a step back. And the step back I want to take is I want to say, what I said at the outset was you've got to understand the context. The context defines what it is you have as real options and the means you have available to pursue your objectives. If you look at the context today, the context is not one that lends itself very easily to resolving the conflict. Look at what the context is. First, you have disbelief among the two populations, Israeli and Palestinian population. The best indication of the disbelief is look at the polling. The polling is actually quite remarkable. And it gives you both a sense of possibility, but it also tells you what an uphill climb it's going to be. Three weeks ago, there was a poll in Israel that showed that 78% of the public, 78%, so we're talking about almost four out of five people, would support the Clinton parameters as the basis for resolving the conflict. So all the talk about, gee, there's a shift taking place in Israel. If you look at the, the, the makeup of the, of the Israeli population, the polling doesn't suggest that when it comes to this. 78% would be prepared to accept the Clinton parameters. The problem is nearly the same amount believes that that, that will never be possible because of the way they look at the Palestinians. The flip side of that, and there's almost a mirror image, the number isn't 78%, but if you look at a series of polls on the Palestinian side, 
there's a very consistent number of between 60 and 70 percent who will accept the two-state outcome on terms that may not be the exact replica of the Clinton parameters, but are not that far from the Clinton parameters. But the same 60 to 70 percent believe it'll never happen. The Israeli public looks at the Palestinians and believes they're never really prepared to accept us, as we are. The Palestinians look at the Israelis and say they're never really prepared to accept our independence because they don't control us. Now that creates a context for leaders. There's no great pressure on the leaders to solve the conflict, number one, and number two, they know there's fundamental disbelief. So that's not a real favorable political context in which to be pushing for big decisions by the leaders. There's a second contextual factor that works against the leaders making big decisions. That contextual factor is what's happening in the region. The rising tide of the Muslim Brotherhood has a chilling effect on both sides. For Abu Mazen to contemplate making the kinds of compromises he has to make to produce an outcome is going to produce, for certain in his eyes, a backlash from the Muslim Brotherhood. And they represent a rising tide. For Prime Minister Netanyahu, he looks at the rising tide of the Muslim Brotherhood and says, gee, that's the wave of the future all around us. This is a time for me to be making big concessions? Not the instinct. Now, what I just described is a difficult time, and it could be used to justify doing nothing. It could be. The problem with doing nothing is it comes with a high price because it will deepen the disbelief on each side, which makes the pursuit of peace even harder. Uh, it will build the momentum behind those who believe that there is no solution, let's go for one state. And anybody who thinks there's a one-state solution doesn't understand the nature of this conflict. Did I write it on Twitter? <laughs> I can write it on any form you want. <laughs> this, is a, this is a dialogue, right? It yeah, uh, uh, starts early. All right, the, um, I can explain it. Why do I say it? I start off by saying two national movements competing for the same space, two distinctly different national identities. The most eloquent argument I ever heard for the two-state solution was actually made by a Palestinian named Ahmed Ghanim, who's an activist on the Palestinian side. And he gave a speech back in, I think, 2003 or 2004, at actually where I am now, the Washington Institute for Middle East Policy, where he said, the reason he believed in a two-state solution is because these two national identities are such that if you try to put them in one state, either one or the other will have to try to force the other into submission. And there'll be, there'll be no peace because there'll always be that imperative to force the other into submission and no acceptance until you have succeeded. So one state, the concept of one state is basically a prescription for enduring conflict. That's what it is. That's what it means. And you don't want, if you sit back and you do nothing, on the one hand, you build a momentum on one side for a one-state instinct, and on the other, you're challenging Israel, the character of Israel, because the demographic clock isn't going to stop. It is an objective reality that the Soviet Union, I said, uh, you, know, you can always tell the age of somebody when, this, when they were trained, they're a specialist on a country that no longer exists. <laughs> it's kind of a dead giveaway. Soviets used to refer to something called objective reality. It means fact, you know. Here is a case where the demographics don't lie. You can debate when the tipping point comes, but you can't debate the reality of it. And if Israel is going to be Jewish and democratic, it can't stay where it is. So both sides have a need that we don't stand pat and we don't sit and do nothing. But the context, as I described it, says it's pretty difficult. So what do we do? So here's my hybrid model. My hybrid model is you continue to pursue negotiations. <coughs> Even though, as I said, the context for negotiations isn't great and the public isn't going to much believe in them, but you still need to pursue them for one simple reason. There has to be a political process that can promise a political vision. But if that's all you're doing, you can't overcome the context and you can't overcome the disbelief. You have to change the context and the negotiations are unlikely to change the context. So what will change the context is real acts on the ground. We'll send a message to both sides that something is different, that something is changing, and that there's a genuine commitment to reaching peace. Not by what they say, 
but by what they do on the ground. Now, Joel has a concept which, in fact, is a quite interesting concept, which is that the Israelis would actually begin to build a significant housing for those settlers who would have to be moved out of the West Bank. And you, build, you begin that process now. So you don't have this imagery where they have no place to go. So you send a message to them. So you send a message to your own public that you're serious about it. And so you send a message to the Palestinians that you're serious about this. The Palestinians continue building their state as a way of saying, we want a two-state solution. We're not counting on something else. We want a two-state solution. The truth is, throughout the process, at least in the Obama years, there was an emphas emphasis on state building through what Fayyad was doing. But this is a practical way for each side to do something. And it's consistent with my notion you have something from the ground up. Now, I would do something beyond what Joel has, not because his idea isn't good. It's just that there isn't going to be one idea that's going to be sufficient. There's going to be multiple ideas that are going to have to work in tandem to reinforce what it is we're trying to get done. I would like the Israelis to send a message to the Palestinians that they're prepared to validate those Palestinians who are working on state building and those Palestinians who believe in nonviolence. When you look at those who believe in state building on the Palestinian side, some challenge them and say they're just making the occupation palatable. The way to answer that is to show that the occupation is receding. So I've, I've made a suggestion where if you look at the West Bank, the West Bank is divided. This is based on the negotiations, first the interim agreement and then the Y River Memorandum, which we negotiated during the Clinton years, divided the West Bank into three zones. There's the interim agreement that first established three zones, Y River then expanded them. Area A, which is where the Palestinians have civil and security responsibility, is 18.2% of the territory. Area B is 21.7% of the territory, and that's where the Palestinians have civil responsibility and responsibility for law and order, but not responsibility for dealing with terror. That remains an Israeli responsibility. Area C is 60.1% of the West Bank. And what I would like to do, in keeping with the idea of showing Israeli control is receding, on the Israeli side, the Israelis would, let's say, Area C, which is the largest, 60.1%. There, the Palestinians have close to zero economic access and activity. They have very minuscule economic access and activity in Area C, even though Area C is 60.1% of the West Bank. Open up Area C for Palestinian economic activity. It will be, first of all, have an economic impact. Secondly, it sends a message of reduced Israeli control. Thirdly, it sends a message to everybody that something is changing. In Area B, the Palestinians have a police presence for dealing with law and order. They coordinate closely with the IDF as it is. Expand that presence. Increase the police stations, increase the Palestinian police presence. It immediately sends a signal that something is changing and every Palestinian also sees it. Area A, the Israelis still have occasional incursions into Area A. Now, this is the area where the Palestinians have civil and security responsibility. Now, every time the Israelis go in, they don't go in because they want to go in. They go in because usually there's a security-related reason. But every time they go in, they send a message that the Palestinian police, the Palestinian security forces, who otherwise are actually acting, which is one of the reasons, not the only reason, one of the reasons there aren't bombs going off in Israel is because the Palestinians are actually doing what they should be doing on security. But every time the Israelis go in, it grates on Palestinian sensibilities. So come up with an agreed, because the, the two security forces deal with each other all the time now. Let them come up with an agreed set of security criteria that once they're met, the Israelis won't go back into Area A. You take those three steps, and by the way, these, these are illustrative. They give you an idea of what could be done. There are other ideas and I, you know, we could discuss. You take these three ideas, you act on these. Now, what do the Palestinians do? Well, the Palestinians, one of the things that continues to grate on the, Pal on the Israelis is that there remains a lot of incitement. You know, when you name squares after people who have killed Israelis, this is not exactly a way to build confidence in Israel, that in fact the people who are next door are prepared to truly live with you. But the truth is, this is the kind of thing that the two sides could be discussing. They don't have to take my ideas for what the Israelis do in A, B, and C. Let them discuss it directly. What would be the steps that would matter the most to the Palestinians and would most validate those who believe in nonviolence and would most demonstrate 
that in fact someday the occupation was going to end and the people who are committed on the Palestinian side to nonviolence and coexistence are actually on the right track. And what is it that the Israelis would like to see from the Palestinians? That could, could be negotiated directly. So the hybrid model is a political track, but with the political track, that political track should also then be talking about specifics on the ground that can do a lot for each side to demonstrate that in fact the pursuit of peace is genuine by each side. What we've lost is the perception that it's genuine by each side. Joel's idea is one very good way to send a message to each side. I'm suggesting, you know, a set of complementary kinds of ideas. And if you were to build some kind of, of model where you're incorporating these, these kinds of ideas that deal with the disbelief in the context, even while you have a political process going on at the same time, my suggestion to you is the political process will have much more of a chance of working. So there's my hybrid model. It shows that there is still hope. And the one thing that you need when it comes to peacemaking, you cannot lose your hope. I'll stop there, thank you. All right, uh, Ambassador Ross has agreed to answer questions. There are four microphones, one right here, another one just halfway up the steps here, a third one halfway up the steps there, and a fourth one there. Since there are long lines down below, I encourage you to go up on uh, top because I'll go around the, uh, the circle here. Now, uh, those of you that have come to the Kennedy School on many occasions will know what a good question at the Kennedy School is. Uh, first, it starts by your identifying yourself. Second, it is very short and contains but one thought. And third, it ends with a question mark. So let me start right over here. I'm Roger Whalen. I'm a visitor from Santa Barbara, California. And uh, I follow your thinking, and uh, I followed the situation in Israel for the last uh, two decades. See very little progress there. I love this idea of yours, and, and the young man here. And uh, I'm wondering uh, who is, how would Netanyahu, uh, how does he, how do you anticipate he would react to this? And if not, who else in Israel has the statesman? Uh, uh, like ability uh, to get this idea, a very logical idea, a very different idea of yours, uh, uh, implemented? Well, first, um, he's the prime minister. Uh, he's the prime minister who's likely to be prime minister for some time to come. And I think that he would, I think that he would be open to this. Uh, he himself has emphasized for a long time that uh, two-state solution must have an economic underpinning. So some of the things that I'm proposing would fit quite naturally with that. Everything that I outlined, by the way, uh, none of it would put Israeli security at risk. And this is for, for this prime minister in particular, everything he does always starts with that as his point of departure. So I think this would be consistent with what he wants. Joel's idea uh, would be, might be more of a challenge. Uh, because uh, in some ways it has an implication, but I would tell you the truth, I don't think he would, in truth, I don't believe he'd have a problem with Joel's idea either, because in fact, you know, what, what Joel is suggesting is you build housing in places like the Galilee, uh, where there is space, uh, and, uh, and I think it would be completely consistent with what, by the way, a number of other people have, who have in Israel have focused on who are heavily focused on the demographic issue. So I actually think each of these are manageable ideas uh, in terms of the Israelis. I think we, on the Palestinian side, we have, you would have a certain constituency that would favor them very much. I think it's important that the only way I think, I think the biggest problem for Abu Mazen would be if he thought this was an alternative to the political process. He remains focused, I think, on the, on, on the big issues uh, even though I think he would find it difficult to act on the big issues. So I think as long as you make it clear, which is why I call for the hybrid approach, that this is not a substitute for the political process, uh, I think that in fact it has a chance to work for both sides. Good luck. Thanks. Right up here. Hi, um, I feel privileged to be here to listen to you and I agree 100% when you're saying. Um, you identify yourself? Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, um, Steve Shapiro. Um, 
I agree 100% with you when you're about the disillusionment because I'm one of those disillusioned people. Um, and so my question for you is, um, why would why should I ever have any hope that the Palestinians are ever serious about peace? Because all I ever heard from them is no, no, no. Um, my best example is what you were involved in uh, 12 years ago in, in Camp David in 2000. Um, you had Ehud Barak offer everything the Palestinians ever dreamed of, 97% of the land, I believe, um, with land swaps, um, everything they wanted except for um, having the Palestinians flood into Israel. Um, and what did Yasser Arafat respond? He said no. He left the conference without an agreement and one, a couple months later started the second intifada. So to me, that's the Palestinians, what they always want is just no Israel. And when they say peace, they just mean a piece of Israel. They don't understand P-A-C-E, -E, but just P-I-C-E. -E. So I just can respond to that. Thank you. You know, I've, um, my attitude is basically the following, uh, and that is that uh, I've dealt with a lot of Palestinians who I actually believe do want peace, and I spell it P-E-A-C-E. -E. The first book I wrote was called The Missing Peace, and I didn't spell it P-I-E-C-E, -E, I spelled it P-E-A-C-E. -E. Uh, I do believe that there are Palestinians who want it. I am worried about the, the trend among Palestinian intellectuals toward one state because that, A, will never happen, uh, and B, it just makes it harder to produce what is necessary to happen for both sides' interests. Uh, and I'm also a big believer that, you know, you, you keep trying and you put things to the test even while you always preserve a kind of insurance policy. I do believe that the, you know, when, when Abu Mazen says that he's in favor of a two-state solution, I believe that he's in favor of a two-state solution. I also believe, you know, Bibi Netanyahu has said the same thing. The problem is the context is such that neither one is prepared to take big steps forward, so you have to try to change the context. But the other thing is, I've had each of them say to me when I was still in the administration, they each asked me, is the other one serious? And what I said to each of them was the same thing. It's not up to me to vouch for the other. Test them, test them. Right up here. Hi, my name is Brightman, I live in the area. And you mentioned that uh, Egypt and the Muslim Brotherhood is a real concern. And so I would imagine that at some point the situation may actually get worse. They may run out of their reserves. And so my question is, um, isn't that also an opportunity? Who are the stakeholders in, in ensuring that there's some hope in that country? And can't that be tied into some kind of a long-term resolution? Um, I'm not optimistic that we're going to see the Egyptians play much of a role that could be positive on this anytime soon. But I think by the same token, you have to understand that the preoccupation in Egypt and elsewhere is internal. It's not external. It is interesting that the Muslim Brotherhood, when you had a flare-up about a month ago uh, in firing of rockets from Gaza into Israel, Hamas didn't stop it didn't stop the rockets, but Hamas didn't fire the rockets. It was Islamic Jihad that was doing it. The Islamic Jihad funded by the Iranians. And it was the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt that worked pretty feverishly supporting what was the, you know, the, the SCAP, the military, in bringing this to an end because they didn't want a flare-up and an escalation because they can't afford it. Now, their attitudes towards Israel, the Muslim Brotherhood's attitude towards Israel, are completely inconsistent with peace. They are. On the other hand, what they've announced so far is that they, you know, they would respect the peace treaty with Israel. They need help from the outside. They have to deliver. You know, this is a different Middle East than it was uh, 15, 16 months ago. Most of the people in Egypt and in Tunisia and uh, in other countries where we've seen an upheaval, whether it's Yemen, Syria is a different story where people started off uh, peacefully demonstrating and they face a brutal regime that basically put them in a position where the only way they could protect themselves was through violence. But what you see is that people see themselves as being citizens, not subjects. It's a different political culture that's emerging. What they don't have right now are the institutions that allow them to act as citizens and that's one of the things that has to be developed. 
but the, the point is that if the Muslim Brotherhood thinks they can simply rule as opposed to govern, they're in for a rude, a rude awakening. They may want to be able to control everything, but they're not in a position to do that and they need to deliver. It's not an accident they send a delegation to, the, to Washington on a charm offensive saying that we, wanna, we want you to be our partners in this. They cannot deliver without help. Their economy is in a truly desperate state. So their needs certainly create a preoccupation for them on the inside, not the outside. Their needs also create the ability to affect their behavior. They want help from the outside. You fulfill your international obligations starting with the peace treaty. You want help from the outside. You commit to repeatable elections and respecting the rights of minorities and respecting the rights of women. You don't criminalize the, the private sector. There are things that can be, that become, should become a kind of mantra for the international community when it comes to providing assistance. My, my point in answering the way I am is I don't expect them to play a positive role on the issue of peace. I do expect that their preoccupation will keep them focused domestically and that can be, that can be, can help create an environment where peacemaking is possible. There's a paradox. I talked about how the, the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood probably creates a chilling effect both on Abu Mazen and on Netanyahu. <laughs> but think about it. The, pre the internal preoccupations also gives them a kind of freedom because the rest of the Arab world is not looking over anybody's shoulder. The rest of the Arab world is not preoccupied with this. Abu Mazen may worry about a backlash if he were to make basic compromises. The fact of the matter is, this is not the preoccupation. Most of these countries are focused on how they're gonna develop internally and their citizens are focused primarily on the relationship between them and the new governments that emerge. It's actually about, their preoccupation is about justice for themselves, personal. So it doesn't have to be this kind of inhibiting presence, but you know, I live in the real world. Psychologically, it clearly is. Right over here. Um, I, I, in fact, I have so many questions, but- uh, Identify yourself. Yes, it's, I mean, trade-offs is what we uh, at KS teach us here, but uh, my name is Marwan Durzi and I'm uh, living uh, in uh, Ramallah, Palestine. I, I would like to define myself as being a, a very frustrated human being living in the area. Um, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Israel lately scored uh, one of the uh, best countries, I think 17, in the most happiest uh, countries in the world. The economy is doing great. Abu Mazen is doing a great job in, uh, in keeping security in the West Bank. Uh, settlements are growing. Uh, in fact, uh, freedom of speech in Palestine is being constrained as a result of the, the hard, harsh security measures. Uh, what do you think the U.S. should, should do in order to, uh, to change the incentives for occupations. I mean, taking also into consideration there are enormous economic gains of occupation among the Israeli side. How, how do you think the U.S. should play around and change those incentives? Carrot or stick? Yeah. Or none of the other. First, I, I don't think that, um, I don't think that, in fact, the Israeli presence and settlements in the West Bank are this big economic, economic boon to Israel. I don't see that. Uh, you know, last summer, people forget, you had 400,000 people turning out in Tel Aviv raising social issues, and they themselves were talking about the economic inequality within Israel. Uh, and so I, I don't think that this is, this is a big boon for Israelis. Yes, the economy is doing well, but what you saw was there's a lot of underlying dissatisfaction because the, what is the emerging, the increasing social inequality. That's an issue that's not gonna go away. I do think if you could make peace, you know, it's not gonna solve that problem, but it's gonna help in terms of dealing with that problem, point one. Point two, one of the reasons that you know, I'm, I'm in favor of, a, of the political side of the equation I was talking about is because I do think if you could get, if you could have negotiations on territory and security, you would settle the settlement issue. You know, Dan Meridor, who's in this Israeli land, raised the issue of why should the Israelis be building outside the blocks? If you favor a two-state solution, why should you be building any settlements in what's gonna be the Palestinian state? Now, he's a member of this government raising that question. So I think, you know, if you solve the issue of, of where the border's gonna be, and you can't solve where the border's gonna be independent from security, the two are inextricably linked. 
then you take care of the settlement issue. And so I would, that's one of the reasons I want to continue to, I want a political process. What I was trying to suggest is if we don't change the context psychologically, the way I was trying to suggest, it's hard to produce the progress on the political side. There's obviously, and these can be mutually reinforcing tracks, where if you begin to change the context and then you make progress in the negotiations, then it reinforces and it becomes a kind of virtuous cycle. We've had the opposite of a virtuous cycle. We've had what is clearly a kind of, instead of a, a process that builds confidence, we've had a process that destroys it. And it's on both sides. That's why we are where we are. I want to reverse that dynamic. Right over here. Hi, my name is Michael Eisenberg. I live in Jerusalem and a partner at Benchmark Capital, and I think probably responsible for the first venture capital investment in Ramallah. Um, first of all, as a citizen of Israel, I want to say I admire your perseverance in sticking your neck in here for 15 years. Um, but I want to analyze what you said before about the disillusionment. Uh, in 1993, when I first arrived in Israel, I don't think 70% of the population was disillusioned. Uh, not in Israel and probably not on the Palestinian side. There was great hope for a while. And it would appear that the continuation of the peace process, or what others would refer to as the peace industry, has created more and more disappointments along the way that have led to more and more disillusionment. And if you look back at what happened in Egypt with Sadat, that was actually a moment of despair before he came back over the line and came to peace. Could it be, and I want to maybe challenge your assertion earlier and get your feedback, um, that actually continuing the process, which you referred to as creating hope, is in fact doing the opposite. It's creating more disillusionment. And if we focused each side on its own internal issues, building economy, state building on the Palestinian side, solving some social issues on the Israeli side and societal cohesion, but we ignored the peace process for a while, that actually may lead to a better result over a longer term. I think it's an interesting idea. Uh, and there's no doubt, you know, I don't dispute your premise. That's what I, that's what I outlined, that we've seen, we didn't see a, a an approach to peace that has built this kind of belief, we've seen it accompanied by a disbelief. The problem, I think, is that if you only focus on the internal building, that's fine from an Israeli perspective. I don't think it's fine from a Palestinian perspective because the Palestinians have this built-in suspicion that in the end, uh, the, you know, they're supposed to be satisfied with economic gains, but they'll never really get their political gains. That's why I don't think if you, if you try to create a divorce between the two, you're going to feed the sense that there's a, there's a deep suspicion about what the game is about. And the game is about denying them their political aspirations by trying to satisfy them with economic goodies. And I don't think that will work. I think you're going to, in the end, you'll get greater pressures and they'll express themselves in ways that are not so positive. So I, th I think you have to have both. I'm not calling for a, you know, a, a, a traditional peace process. What I'm trying to suggest is we have to have something tangible on the ground that people feel that will satisfy them, maybe not satisfy but that will convince them that the other side is actually for real about wanting an outcome that they can live with. Today the problem is the perception that neither side believes the other is really interested in an outcome that they can live with. Right up here. Good afternoon, thank you for the talk. Um, my name is Shijoini, I'm a first year student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, my question is uh, regarding there's a considerable disconnect between uh, Gaza and the West Bank and there is no one true united Palestinian voice. So when we're talking about negotiations, who does Israel start ne negotiating with and what can the U.S. do in this regard? Well, there's obviously there's no doubt that the um, fact that Gaza is controlled by Hamas, the West Bank is controlled by Fatah. Uh, there have been, I think by my count, four agreements on reconciliation now. Um, I don't know how many more there will be. The one thing that's characterized these reconciliation agreements between Hamas and Fatah is they have agreements, they just don't have reconciliation. Uh, so I think the reason they don't have reconciliation is because you have two different groups that each have not only a different vision, but also a very different view. This is about a competition for power. The you know, there are many people who say, well, shouldn't you, know, shouldn't you deal with Hamas? Uh, my answer is no, and I'll explain why. Uh, you know, I was around, and I wish, it was, I wish it was only 15 years that I was doing this kind of thing. 
Um, I was around when uh, we launched the dialogue with the PLO. For a very long time, we had a set of conditions for such a dialogue, and in the end, the PLO met it. So I don't understand why we would have a set of, di a set of conditions for a dialogue with the PLO, which we, we basically stuck to, and they met, but we would relax our conditions for Hamas. The minute we would do that, we would send a message that we think they're the wave of the future. You would absolutely, I think, demoralize those Palestinians who actually believe in nonviolence, and we should have an interest in promoting those who believe in nonviolence, not the other way around. Uh, I don't understand why renouncing violence and recognizing Israel's right to exist and abiding by previous agreements uh, should be s such an intolerable set of demands for Hamas. Uh, on my way up here today, I read an interview that Abu Marzouk, who is supposedly a moderate uh, on the Palestinian side, gave to actually the, the Jewish newspaper, The Forward, in which uh, you know, he was prepared to accept a long-term, what he called a long-term hudna, which is a ceasefire, but he wasn't prepared to recognize Israel. He wasn't prepared to renounce violence. Uh, he did think a long-term hudna would be better than violence, but the conditions for a long-term hudna is that Israel has to accept the right of return for Palestinian refugees to Israel, which is Another way, if you agree to commit suicide, I'm willing to have a ceasefire with you. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I'm just, I don't buy that that's an approach that can be particularly productive. I do think that if you build the credibility of those Palestinians who believe in nonviolence, that will affect the overall dynamic among Palestinians. Uh, you know, I don't believe that most Palestinians adhere to the vision that Hamas has. One interesting manifestation, the polling today in Gaza demonstrates that Hamas is profoundly unpopular. You know, one of the interesting realities is wherever Islamists have been in power, they don't do very well. So, you know, I think if you can actually show that there is a peaceful alternative, if you can validate those Palestinians who believe in nonviolence and coexistence, by showing that, in fact, the occupation is shrinking, then I think you'll build the weight of those Palestinians and you'll build the strength of those Palestinians who don't believe in what Hamas is offering. And I suspect in those circumstances, Hamas itself shrinks. Right up there. Good afternoon and thank you for the talk. My name is Don Broder. I'm a senior in the college, I'm originally from Tel Aviv. This conference, to a large extent, has been about business and economic initiatives to bring the two people together to create mutual dependencies and establish the trust that we need so much, so much. In your view, what is the potential of such initiatives in today's reality? Well, I favor these kinds of initiatives just because, you know, when I, s when I said before, I don't think the answer is to focus only internally. I didn't mean to suggest that that isn't an important element of what should be done. So I think the more you know, you, you have these kinds of conferences good. Look, in addition to that, you created a competition here on ideas. The first prize won by Joel, who is also a member of a group called One Voice, which I have also been a supporter of for some time. Uh, you know, these kinds of initiatives are completely consistent with what I call the ground up approach to building peace. At the end of the day, you can't do, you can't build peace from the top down alone nor can you build it from the ground up, you have to integrate the two. To the extent to which these kinds of conferences become a source of inspiration, and they provide additional ideas, and they provide additional energy, and they provide additional passion, and they create a sense of mobilization around the importance of making the effort, you know, few things are more important. Right here, and we'll probably have time for two more questions. Thank you, good afternoon. My name is uh, Noam Eital, I'm a senior at Babson College. And, uh, Part of my question was answered uh, earlier, but follow up on that. Uh, you talked about a two-state solution. Currently, the way I see it, it's almost a three-state solution with Gaza and the West Bank. But even if that was to be reconciled, uh, under any agreement, Salam Fayyad would be out of that, uh, the, the government, the unity government. What role do you think that would play, considering that uh, Salam Fayyad has been such a liberal force in the Palestinian um, government? Well, I think the key, first, 
he's become the focal point for the donor community because he introduced transparency. Uh, and you know what, what has plagued Fatah was the perception of corruption. The reason Hamas won the elections in 2006 was because A, they were unified and ran one slate, Fatah was completely divided and multiple factions competed against each other. What a surprise that when you divide the vote, you don't do very well. Uh, but also because they were plagued by the perception of corruption and Hamas was plagued, not plagued, Hamas was perceived as, as not corrupt. I think that image of Hamas, certainly where they have power in Gaza, has changed. So the, the issue here is it can't be only one person in any case. It's a system that you're promoting. Obviously, there are people associated with Bayad. Uh, you know, I, I believe the key uh, is that at some point, you're going to have elections among the Palestinians. And a lot depends upon the nature of organization. I don't believe any, quote, third force is likely to do that well in the, you know, in the foreseeable future just because there's a – the nature of political and social identity is built around movements there. And the absence of a third force with any social roots is going to inhibit it. <coughs> but I do think that uh, Fatah has a younger generation that is emerging in it. Maybe not the old guard, but the younger generation that's emerging in it. They have – they learned some of the lessons from 2006. Uh, and I think it's important to create a kind of – you know, some kind of coalition between Fayyad and the people who would support him and the reforming – elements, the younger movement uh, within Fatah. And I think if that happens, then it, then it offers some hope for the future. Ambassador, I can't let you leave with, without asking you a little bit about Iran as one of your main portfolio. Uh, and uh, are you at all – are you more optimistic uh, as a result of the recent uh, conference and so forth? Do you see a path that offers some hope? You know, I, I – um, The Obama administration has had an approach, and the, the essence of the approach was if engagement, which was genuinely and legitimately sought in the, uh, in the first uh, part of the administration, didn't bear fruit, that the engagement itself would become a basis on which to mobilize the world against Iran. I mean, the logic being that we want to be able to talk to the Iranians to see if we can resolve our differences, but if they're not prepared to engage that way, which they were not in the first year of the administration, and frankly, we're seeing only now some signs of their interest in engagement, uh, then the world will understand that Iran's behavior has to change. And the thrust of the policy was to create a context where the pressure would build so much on Iran, they would seek to reduce that pressure. Because the pressure would be high as they measured it. The price would be high as they measured it, not as, as someone else thinks it should be measured as being high. So if you look at the context that's been created, Iran is isolated internationally now in a way they never have been before. The best manifestation of that is the UNGA, which has hardly been the forum that typically supports the U.S. I invite you to look at any number of votes from the UNGA if you doubt that. Uh, there's a vote – there was a vote in the end of September, early October against Iran, 106 to 9. No Muslim majority country voted with Iran. So talk about isolation. That's a pretty good indication of it. The regional balance of power has shifted against Iran. You know, in the first year of the Obama administration, when I took a tour uh, of the region, every leader that I talked to uh, and was preoccupied with Iran. None of them were prepared to say what they were saying in private and public because there was a fear about a backlash, what the Iranians could do in response. What's interesting is the, the day the European Union announced that they planned to boycott Iranian oil, starting on July 1, Saudi Arabia, immediate, Saudi Arabia immediately announced that they would fill in the gap. And when the Iranians declared that that was a hostile act, the Saudis said, we'll help balance the whole market. So the intimidation value that existed has also shifted. And what's going on in Syria has added to the momentum of isolating and shifting the balance of power in the region. And now what Iran is suffering from economically, you know, their currency has been devalued by half. You know, they – uh, now the, the, uh, the electronic system that allows financial transactions to, to be managed internationally, something called the SWIFT system, which the Iranians last year had 2.2 million transactions in, they now can have zero. 
Everywhere they look, they got a problem. They've lost about 400,000 barrels a day of oil that they can't sell. Uh, they're putting that oil on tankers because they have because the dilapidated nature of their oil fields is such that they can't afford not to maintain the pressure within their oil fields lest water seep in and contaminate the fields. They're running out. They're about to run out of the tankers they can put oil on. So everywhere they look, they have a problem. Uh, and it's not an accident that a year ago, uh, when there was the, the 5 plus 1 was meeting with the Iranians, the Iranians wouldn't talk about their nuclear program and wouldn't engage on the conference building ideas that were raised by the 5 plus 1. The talks were cut off. The Iranians said they would only discuss those items if, in fact, all sanctions were lifted and if uh, the 5 plus 1 recognized in advance the Iranian right to enrich. Now, the sanctions not only weren't lifted, they were made de much, uh, much more demanding. Uh, and there's been no recognition of their right to enrich. And yet the Iranians are back at the table talking about both. The only thing that's changed from last year is the pressure. Does that mean that there's going to be a deal? No, but it is very interesting that the commentary in the Iranian press now, leaving aside the foreign minister, who is positive about the outcome of these recent discussions, Kayan, which is the newspaper most closely associated with the supreme leader, is also suddenly positive about this. So what I conclude from this is that there is diplomacy has a chance. It never had a chance unless you created, a, again, the word context. It's actually my middle name. <laughs> unless you created the context in which they would look for a way to reduce the pressure and therefore adjust their behavior, you didn't have a chance for diplomacy to work. That context has been created. It doesn't guarantee that there'll be a deal. What it does suggest, however, is that there's the, pos there's the possibility of such a deal. We'll have to go to the last question. Yes, sir. Uh, Marvin Brams, Divinity School. This actually feeds into this uh, discussion of Iran. I heard a, a very high-level speaker from Iran here uh, a few days ago, and her view was that um, uh, it, 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 would not, it would not be uh, in Israel's interest to actually consider Iran as a real threat nuclear or otherwise, simply because they weren't in any condition to be a real threat. Now, she understood why Israel felt that way, but that it would really be a, a mistake to act on those feelings in some uh, military or aggressive way. I'm wondering what you, what you would think of that. Again, <laughs> the, the, uh, you know, when someone describes you as a cancerous tumor, that says you should be wiped off the map. When they parade their rockets down the street and on the side they have written, you know, it's, uh, it's yeah. targeted for to get rid of the Zionist entity, the way they describe it. When they say you should disappear and they're developing the means potentially to act on those words, I think if you're an Israeli, pretty hard to say, you know what, don't really think they mean it uh, and and by the way, when they're the ones financing the Islamic Jihad, when they were, I would tell you, when, when I was a negotiator in the 1990s, they were, they were actually providing financial incentives to kill, kill Israelis. So the idea that they don't, you know, that somehow they really can't act on the kind of threats they make and Israel should pretty much dismiss them and take the long view, uh, that might work in the laboratory, but it doesn't work in real life. And it, it will be a big decision for the Israelis if the diplomacy doesn't work. Uh, do they act or do they not act? Israel exists as a refuge for the Jewish people. Uh, and the idea that it would face potentially an existential threat and forego the ability to act on that ex existential threat goes against the DNA. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's the theory that she's outlining just doesn't fit very well with the realities that any Israeli decision maker would have to make. Now that doesn't mean the Israelis will act and because in the end they could decide it's better for the United States to do it. It also doesn't mean that you know if, if there's a diplomatic way out the Israelis wouldn't favor it. The fact is the very concept of crippling sanctions was an Israeli concept. If you were focused only on a non-diplomatic approach you wouldn't develop the concept of crippling sanctions 
unless you thought that the crippling sanctions could actually change Iran's behavior. Mm -hmm. And so there is, I believe, a view on the Israeli side that while prevention is the objective, that there may be a diplomatic way to achieve it, and we'll find out in the coming months whether that's true. Yeah. Well, I think, I, I think Excuse also- Excuse me, thank you, you sorry. Oh, one, okay. one forgot to mention. Um, Ambassador Dennis, context Ross, uh, <laughs> thank you very much for being here. It's been a great honor. Let's all give him a very big hand. Thank you.